Okay, it's two minutes after one. We will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the MHPN September webinar. My name is Xiao Hanbao Smith. Um, we are very excited today to have our, our friend Sharon Ferraro to talk about the topic lead paint. Before we get started, I would like to go over some Zoom items. First of all, if you have any questions, um, please type them into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, so to make sure we can see them. All the questions will be um, answered at the end of the presentation. And you, if you have any thoughts and resources you would like to share, um, please type them into the chat box. And please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. If this is your first time attending our webinar, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We advocate for Michigan's history, historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. So if you are not a member yet, please consider joining us at www.mhpn.org. And this webinar series is supported in part by an award from the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. It is my great pleasure today to introduce you, Sharon Ferraro. Sharon retired in January 2022 as a Kalamazoo Historic Preservation Coordinator. Early in that position, she realized that lead paint was a real hazard and that remediating the hazard could be a substantial threat to historic properties. She served on the Kalamazoo County Lead Hazard Task Force and has presented on lead paint hazard since 2010. At the Biannual Window Standard Coalition, as well as numerous groups, including Michigan Rental Housing Inspectors and MHPN Conference. As a founder of the Old House Network, less safe work practices have been integrated into all the workshops. And with that, I will turn it over to Sharon. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a topic that I know a great deal about and I wish I didn't have to, but it really is important. Um, lead paint is a real hazard. I was hoping back when I first started researching that it would turn out that the hazard was actually overblown, but it hasn't been. Uh, people panic, and I'm going to cover that a little bit, but it it's it hasn't been over overblown. And so I want to give my associates, you folks who are working with historic buildings and especially in historic districts, some idea of how to put it in, how to put the hazard in perspective for your historic districts and the historic resources that you're doing such a great job of protecting. So we're gonna just plunge right in here and get started. Again, as Xiao Han said, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. We don't have a hard stop at two o'clock. So if we have some really good questions and we're just still discussing, we'll be able to go a little past the end there. So um, the question comes down to quite often, what is more important, a historic building or possibly children's health? Sharon, um, could you? Uh share your screen please oh sorry i thought i thought i already was i'm seeing it uh there and nope this one there we go got it yeah okay thank you thank you for being patient with me so originally when the um when the federal government finally decided to get around to regulating lead paint in the in the mid 70s and with the elimination of lead as a uh, ingredient in paint in 1978, they were going through different ways of determining what was a hazard for a child. And originally they said that any blood lead level reading of above like 20 was dangerous, then it went down to 15, then it went down to 10, then about 10 years ago it went down to five and the most recent blood lead level, and I will explain that, that is considered of concern is 3.5, and that's micrograms per deciliter of blood. And that's the only time I'm gonna say that. So um, 
And in Michigan, one of the things to remember is that the landlord is responsible to abate a lead hazard if a tenant child has an elevated blood lead level, even if the child did not obtain the high blood lead level reading in that home. So if they came from uh, another house where they were had an elevated blood level, and now they've moved to your house and your house, you know, as a landlord still has lead paint in it, you're still the one that's the responsible party. Okay, wait a minute, let's put this here and do that. And there we go. Okay, first, the facts. Lead paint can be a hazard, but lead paint present is not automatically a lead paint hazard. So it definitely can be a hazard, but just because it's there does not mean it's a hazard. In a similar way to the antifreeze in your automobile can be a horrific hazard if someone ingested it or your dog licked it up off of the pavement where your car had been parked. But the fact that it's present in your automobile does not automatically make it a hazard to you, your family, or your pets. It may be present, but it's not necessarily a hazard. Lead is in a lot of things. It's in, uh, it's in the glazes of these wonderful corning bowls. It's in windows. It's in plumbing. It's in children's toys. Um, if you fire a lot in a uh, shooting range, there's an entire possibility that someone may get a blood level that's elevated because they fire a lot in a shooting range. Uh, there was a building in Montana that was debilitated from being an American Legion building to being a state office building. And the American Legion had had a shooting range in the basement. And they started having, some of the people who worked in this office started having symptoms of lead poisoning from the lead that was literally in the building itself, almost inculcated into the building. The folks in the basement offices were having a problem. So lead is there, it's tenacious, it sticks around for a long time. So there's lead in a lot of different things. But what we're concerned about is lead paint. Lead is a toxin that can be dangerous when you ingest it or inhale it. It is not water soluble. So if you're working outdoors and you're scraping lead paint um, and you get lead dust on your skin, it's not going to be absorbed through your skin. Uh, and so some of you are saying, hey, about, what about flint with the water that had lead in it? The, the particulate matter of the lead was released when they changed the source of the water and it never dissolved in the water. It was just particulate matter that people then ingested um, because of the because the water system had switched over. Um, children under the age of six are the most fragile. Babies, mothers who are pregnant, that can be a very, very big hazard. And it's a permanent change. It's not like, oh, we can just give you some medicine that you take for a couple of months and it'll all be fine. Um, it's a permanent alteration to the child's cognitive abilities and behavioral changes. Adults can also be affected by lead paint, not necessarily in the same way that children are, because most adults will shed the lead paint, uh, the lead that they uh, take into their blood system. But the kids, because they are growing, it is literally integrated into their bodies and into their bones. So why did they put lead in paint in the first place? It made the color last longer. It was a really nice, tough, washable finish, and it was a natural microbicide. So it was used very, very commonly in um, kitchens, bathrooms, any place where there would be moisture, where mold might grow, and it really did help the mold not grow as easily there. Uh, so it was, it was, it really had a benefit. There's a chance if you have a house that was built before 1940. The chance of it having lead paint somewhere in the house is at the level of 87% or above. So um, there's, you know, it's 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 likely that it's there. And the easiest way to, if you're a homeowner and you're working on your own house, if your house was built before 1940, just assume that the lead paint is there and and take the precautions that you need to take. Um, that's pretty much the way it's treated. Lead is never found in really black paint because it makes the color softer it makes it a gray if it's black so if you have really black 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 paint that's old it probably does not have lead in it um white lead was used, was used for colors it was a more expensive paint so it was more commonly used in upscale homes less so in in lower uh lower income homes except maybe again in the kitchen or the bathroom 
Um, painters would mix the lead in according to what they needed in the late 19th and early 20th century. Paint was not uncommonly 50% lead by weight. So that's a lot of lead. Some paint manufacturers stopped putting lead in paint in the late 1950s just voluntarily because they knew that it was not really going to be a good thing. And in 1978, it was banned except for very specific maritime commercial and industrial uses where the lead was an important component for the facility that, that it was being used in. This one always got me. Dutch Boy was trying to sell the paint to um, parents. And so they give out these free coloring books for kids. And the kids would color a page and send it in for a contest. And if the teacher, um, if the teacher won the contest, they got a solid lead candy bowl with unwrapped candy in it to fill the bowl. So that that's just let's get the kids a real opportunity to be exposed to lead. So people knew that it was a hazard. They just didn't um, in in uh, automobile, in anti knock gasolines, and in paint. People at the federal level knew that it was a hazard, but there wasn't an awful lot of uh, work being done to try to change that so kids would not be exposed to it. Um, kids, okay, this is quick about how dangerous it can be for kids. They have, if they have an elevated blood lead level that's above 40, they have to go to the hospital and usually it takes several days to get their blood lead level down to where it is safe for them to go back out into the world, but they can't move back into a house where they're going to be exposed to lead because once the uh, once the lead is out of their system, it's left open uh, anchor places on their cells for more lead to get in. Kids that are undernourished don't have enough calcium and iron in their diet. The lead very easily fills in those gaps and so it just they they pick it up more easily. So they can't go back to these the house that has lead in it. Um, if and like like I said before, children that are growing can integrate lead into their bones, teeth, and other tissues, and they will only excrete thirty two percent of it after they're no longer exposed to lead. Girls can pass on lead poisoning to their babies when they become pregnant, when they become older. So um, and even if they lose a tooth, a child that has been heavily lead burdened when they lose those baby teeth, because it's been integrated into their teeth, then they will have, uh, they might have a, a quick jump at that time in their blood lead level. If a child or an adult that has blood that's integrated into their bones breaks a bone, they will again get another, uh, they'll get a jump in their blood lead level that's actually circulating through their bodies. While a lot of kids live in um, rental housing that has a high lead paint that may not have been remediated, 45% of the kids with elevated blood lead levels are living in owner-occupied homes. We have a lot more data on poor kids and how their blood lead level is because of the fact that Medicaid requires that any child under the age of six be tested for their blood lead level when they have their annual checkup. So we have a lot more data on uh, the Medicaid kids than we do on everyone else. This is a quick reminder that the reference level, when they start being concerned about what where the child has been exposed to lead has been dropped to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter of blood. And uh, another really important thing to remember is that the federal government, EPA and HUD, since 2010, they have required that anyone working on a house built before 1978 needs to be served with safe work practices. This is an eight hour training. The city of Kalamazoo just presented one, I think it was, yesterday or the day before that was a free training for contractors working in the city so they could get their RRP certification. It's not hard and it's not terribly expensive, um, but it does teach contractors. And if you have an owner that wants to learn about it themselves, that's a really good place to learn about how to work safely if you suspect that there may be lead in the house. Now, when parents hear this about blood, you know, blood lead levels and lead affecting their children, Sometimes they panic because there are lead is in a lot of things. Lead is in um, uh, door fixtures, doorknobs, and that kind of thing. Now it's it's part of the alloy that the item is made from, so it's not what you call bioavailable. Your child is not going to become blood lead level poisoned by licking the doorknob, but it is present there. This is what I say that just because it's present does not mean that it's automatically a hazard. 
So doorknobs, bathtubs, old dishes, toys, especially toys from the dollar store. I'd be very iffy about buying any painted toys that came from the dollar store that were made in China because they're regularly on the list of offending items, um, according to EPA and HUD. Furniture, some furniture, water, sometimes it can be in the water. Um, but our concern is paint. Even if it's in, um, you know, children's sippy cups and Fisher Price toys and everything else, what we're going to be concerned about here is permanent parts of the house, including the paint that's on the walls, interior and exterior. Um, lots of cities in Michigan and all over the country have uh, programs to help landlords remediate homes and uh, owner occupied homes to remediate the problem with the lead paint in the house. So this is, it's, sometimes it's a straight outright grant, sometimes it's a very low interest loan. And if you've been following uh, interest rates lately, we're talking about low interest in the one to 2% level of for loans to take care of the property. So these programs are there. And that means that you may have um, a, a not-for-profit housing agency or a city program that is uh, following up on reports from the Michigan Health Department saying that these children have all elevated blood lead levels. This is where they are living. And then that landlord is now is going to be responsible for, for taking care of that. And so the landlord may be coming to you at your historic district commission saying, this house is in a historic district. I'm under citation for having a child with an elevated blood lead level. What can I do? This is what they're telling me we have to do. One of the things that the um, uh, agency, whoever's doing this reporting on the house will do is they'll produce a pretty comprehensive report on exactly where in the house the lead paint is. And it may be a lot of places, it may be only in a few places, but either way there will be a comprehensive report that says that it's in the windows or it's on the doors. And of course you know that your historic district commission only is relevant to the outside anyway. Um, so this is, you know, so there's if there's a child under the age of six or a pregnant woman in the house that has an elevated blood lead level, these this is how the reporting goes. Okay, so sometimes the money is funded, the money for the program is funded through HUD, or sometimes it's through some other program. Um, Kalamazoo currently has a multi-million dollar grant to remediate lead hazards in uh, rental housing and owner-occupied housing. So this is something that's happening, was happening in our historic district commission and still is. Um, there are, there's the requirements of the grant, whatever the grant is that's gonna pay for the work, there will be some requirements with that. And that may vary from city to city, depending on what their grant requirements are when they got the money from the federal government or from the state program. Um, there's two types of ways to deal with a lead paint hazard once it's identified by this comprehensive report. One is interim controls, and then the other is abatement. Interim controls means that work will be done that will need to be verified every couple of years that the lead paint is no longer a hazard. So for example, if the lead paint was discovered in the woodwork of the kitchen or um, um, on the outside of the house, if the house is painted, or the woodwork in the kitchen has been painted with a new coat of paint, then because that lead is that lead paint is no longer available for a child to be able to scrape a piece off and eat it or to lick it or anything else, then that means that it's doing the job of keeping the lead away from the child. But it does require these regular monitoring to be sure that uh, the condition of the material that was covered with the paint or with vinyl siding or whatever it is has not changed. Abatement means removing all of the lead paint coated materials and discarding them and replacing them. So this, as you can guess quickly, is going to be a substantial change for a historic house to have all the windows replaced. And then at the end of all the work, the project needs to pass a clearance inspection Needs, and then if it's interim controls needs to be abated or needs to be, excuse me, needs to be monitored on a regular basis. And there's a big question still that's kind of outstanding about whether, let's say, for example, if the windows are replaced, 
whether the windows can be salvaged and used somewhere else or not, or are they considered hazardous of themselves the way they are currently? So HUD does have guidelines on how in a certified, a, a historic district can be handled. It doesn't require automatically that, for example, windows be replaced or that the house be covered with vinyl siding. It doesn't require that. Quite often a nonprofit agency that may be handling the work may want to do that because it's quicker and easier just to replace a component than it is to get the lead off of it so that now it's safe if it's repainted. So um, these are the four categories of waste. And so as you can see, architectural debris, windows, doors, trim, can sometimes be salvaged, but sometimes not. So that's not always gonna be, salvage is a big question for me because these windows are so wonderfully made, it would be sad to lose them all, but sometimes that is not possible because they are still classified as hazardous by themselves. The key thing for windows and doors is uh, friction surfaces. This is where you're going to find some of the most detailed reporting on in the in the lead assessment is going to be about friction surface. This is where you have one painted surface rubbing over another painted surface and replacing or creating dust. The idea that you have that if you look at that picture on the left here, you'll see all the little tiny paint chips. The idea that children are becoming poisoned because they stand at the window and eat all the paint chips. Quick aside, lead tastes sweet. So sometimes children will eat the chips because they taste a little sweet. Um, the, when that becomes a dust and you have your little, you know, 14 month old baby crawling around on the floor and getting picking up lead dust on her hands and then she eats a candy bar or a cookie or something and now she's got lead dust inside her that's the thing is so whenever you have a friction surface that can create dust so um there are several solutions for that one could be that it could be covered with the metal panning so that yes there may be still some old paint under there but it's covered with metal so the that the lead paint as it chips or dust is no longer available um, you could do replacement windows. So there there are, but there are very detailed steps in these HUD documents that talk about how in a historic building, lead paint can be dealt with without necessarily replacing all the components. So the friction services need to test. There are interim controls, and that includes stripping off the paint, recoating it, um, making sure you got all the dust out, you can also put uh, jam liners in that will allow the window to be open and closed, but they completely cover the painted surface on the inside of the window in the jam. So this means that you may still have the original window sashes, the moving parts of the window, but you no longer have the lead paint hazard because you've stripped all the paint off of the sashes, and now it's moving in a track that does not have any lead paint on it. So this is, this is one of the interim controls that is allowed. But again, these need to be monitored on a fairly regular basis by the agency or the landlord or the homeowner, it depends on what, um, what the circumstances were and the requirements of the grant money. Windows can be salvaged. Um, deconstruction is actually encouraged in a lot of HUD documents, but they want to, um, you know, so that they could be used again, so they can be taken out and reused. This, however, is what abatement looks like. This is a house in Kalamazoo that was abated without the permission of the Historic District Commission. They just literally took out anything that was painted and put the windows in a pile under a plastic tarp and everything else was just thrown away, just discarded. And this was a, a house in the boundaries of the Historic District. So this is what real abatement looks like. You just take it and throw it away. Components can be replaced. These are the windows from that house. They were just put under a tarp and then they were put in a um, one of those portable storage units and closed up nice and tight. So by the time we got around to actually looking at them to see if they could be reused, they'd molded substantially. Um, so building component replacement, you know, you can just replace things and that is an easy way, but um, it's, that's the, 
HUD likes component replacement because they know that the lead has gone that way. It's now in a, 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 a hazardous waste dump or a regular dump somewhere, but it's not for a historic home or historic building, losing those character defining features is, that's a real loss. Once it's gone, it's gone. So, um, so where they have to be replaced though, according to the HUD standards that they have set up for the process of dealing with homes in a historic district, um, they can, they, it needs to be a matching, if it needs to be replaced, it needs to match what was there. It can't just be something that's kind of close. It can't be vinyl. It can't be um, something else that, you know, it needs a wood window that's painted to be as close a match as you can get to the original material that was there. The ideal, the best of all possible worlds is that the window is rehabilitated, the paint is stripped off, the jam liners are put in, the original windows are there. And if correctly, it should be able to pass its clearance testing at the end of the project when they look for any lead residue that's left over. Um, we've had, we had at least four situations here in Kalamazoo where the agency that was doing the rehab went that route and they passed all their clearance tests after it was over and it's fine. They still need to monitor occasionally just to be sure, but most of the time it's just done. So most agencies that are handling old houses that are being rehabbed for rental or a landlord that wants to get rid of it, they're going to they're gonna be going towards abatement because it's just a permanent change to them where it means that item that door, that window, that porch rail that had lead paint on it is now gone. So we don't need to worry about it being a lead hazard anymore because it's just plain gone. So this is something that uh, we in the historic districts want to avoid if we can, but we may not always be able to. So, so enclosure is good. Enclosure includes painting with a lead uh, there are paints that specifically trap and encapsulate lead so that it doesn't, it's not going to be available anymore. Even if that top layer of new paint comes off, it it works with the lead to make it less likely to be um, a, a hazard anymore. But that's, it depends on what you can talk or what the agency or the owner that's handling the house or the building is willing to do and invest in. So there's, like I said, there's interim controls and there's abatement. Um, interim controls are more work intensive. Um, they tend to be a better economic impact on the local community because instead of bringing in windows that were manufactured in Minnesota, you are, in, you are employing people who live in your community to actually do the work. Um, abatement is quick and easy, but even abatement is, uh, is needs to be re examined after 20 years. They don't have the expectation that it's going to be a permanent, permanent, permanent change. Although I don't know what could actually change to make that happen. So um, this, was a, this was a project house in Kalamazoo. The brown, the upper picture is before the windows were replaced and the lower picture is after the windows were replaced. It was a rental property in Kalamazoo. So for you guys, for the Historic District Commission, what do you consider? It's a lead project. That doesn't mean that it gets an automatic thumbs up. Okay, go ahead, hunky dory, great idea. You chose wonderful windows. Yes, go ahead. No, you need to make your decision in the same way that you would make any decision about a building in your historic district. Especially, you're going to be considering Secretary of the Interior Standards number six, you know, character defining features, deteriorated resources will be repaired rather than replaced. When it needs to be replaced, it should match the old and design color texture and where possible materials, that kind of thing. So you're going to be making your decision based on the same criteria that you would use, whether someone was asking to rebuild their front steps or restore a front porch rail or put a new roof on. You're going to be using the same criteria that you use to make all your decisions. Hopefully, you'll also be able to reference this lead-based paint and historic preservation process that HUD has put into place. This, this is acceptable to them. The big question is going to be whether this treatment 
is acceptable to the agency or the owner doing the work? Because the big question is who's going to pay for it? Uh, stripping the paint, rehabbing the windows, getting them working again without necessarily replacing them may be more expensive, may not be more expensive. It depends. So you should get that. Uh, you need to get the report that comes from the lead assessment, the risk assessment, and need to consider the component, the condition of the windows. Is there a lot of chipping paint? Are the windows themselves in rough shape or are they in good shape, except maybe they need to lose, they need to lose the paint to get rid of the hazard? Um, the, it is up to the agency or the contractor doing the work to prepare a proposal for the Historic District Commission. It isn't up to you as a commission to um, create the proposal or how the work is to be done. You're going to review it like you would any other project. You know, this is how we want to put an addition on. Okay, what's it going to look like? You'd be looking at those plans. The same kind of thing for lead paint, except that you're talking about what 99% of the time is going to be a historic component that needs to be uh, the hazard on it needs to be addressed. It's a thin layer of paint, usually less than an eighth of an inch thick. Can we address this somehow without necessarily replacing the entire component? So uh, the challenge is that most abatement contractors who do lead paint abatement have no training in window rehab, so they don't know how to do it. So you're talking about possibly a subcontractor that may add to the cost. And also, and this is this is a truth, that there's a severe shortage of qualified contractors that know how to rehab windows to handle lead paint hazard without replacement. We have a shortage nationwide. There's a shortage of contractors everywhere in the United States. The Home Builders Association reported last year that 77% of its members were reporting a shortage of uh, contractors and construction people to work on their projects. 77%. So this is not just a shortage in the historic preservation trades community. This is a shortage nationwide in the skilled trades. So there may be what I'm talking about, the shortage of contractors, and I'm talking about working with the agency that's doing the work. These may be um, challenges that your commission is going to have to deal with and figure out. Um, now, if all that's going to happen, it could be a staff approval, administrative approval. If all that's going to happen is that they're going to put sash tracks on and strip the paint and get the windows moving again, the fact that there are metal sash tracks inside uh, behind the storm windows or holding the windows up shouldn't, that could be an administrative approval. There's going to be no visible difference from the, uh, because only that one piece has changed, the sash track has been covered. So that could be a staff approval. It would not have to go to the full commission. Replacement usually needs to be reviewed by the full commission. Um, so you, your commission is going to need to review it. They're going to want to come up with as close a match as they can for replacement of the windows. Or rehabilitation also would be, let me go back one. Rehabilitation of the existing windows would definitely be a that would be a staff approval too, because you're not changing the windows, you're just fixing them. Um, it'd be, uh, windows can be salvaged, maybe, that would be nice, but that's not something you can always count on. We've had some success, we've not had some success. So remember the Secretary of the Interior Standards number six that you're using and whatever your local guidelines say about whether or not you can do, what type of replacement windows that you could do. Some, some, uh, HDCs say that vinyl windows are not allowed, period. And it's just a single sentence. Vinyl windows are not appropriate on a historic resource, period. That's done. So what type of uh, window would be appropriate? How close can the match be? And um, it seems sad to me that the, the only thing that is making this a hazard is the fact that there's a, a layer of paint on the wood, even if the wood is in great condition for the windows or for the outside. Another remediation for um, houses that are painted with lead paint on the outside that is totally acceptable under the HUD guidelines for non-historic houses is vinyl siding. 
uh, that's something we don't necessarily want in the historic district. So again, that may be another thing that would come up. This is a quick case study of a, a project we had here in Kalamazoo. It was in our Stewart Area Historic District, which is our second oldest residential historic district. It was an older couple that lived there. They had custody of their grandchildren. One of the children has an elevated level of lead in their blood, one of the three kids. And so after the lead hazard report, the windows were the only exterior components that are within the purview of the Historic District Commission that needed to be addressed in some way. Um, the existing windows were not just plain one over one double hung. They had a little bit of, of design, a little bit of uh, an interesting treatment here in the upper sashes. And so the, the applicant was not asking for the windows to be completely replaced, but they did want to get rid of, remember we're talking of friction surface. So the moving components, the lower sashes were what they were asking to replace. And so what they did was they, um, they, they asked to replace all the sashes with wood windows, all of the sashes, if there was no fancy upper sash, they would just replace both and it would all be the same. And it would be a wood window that was a very close visual match in terms of the width of the frame, the styles and the rails of the existing ones. And then for the leaded sashes and the divided light sashes, they fixed those windows permanently in place. They screwed them tight, um, stripped the paint off of them in the, in the project, stripped the paint off of them, but now they're no longer a friction surface. They can't move up and down and shed paint. And so that's no longer a hazard. And then they replaced just the bottom sash of those windows. So the exterior appearance afterwards was actually, it was very hard to see that there was any difference at all. So, that's kind of it. So, Jahan, do we have any questions? Yes. Thank you for this presentation. It's really informative. Um, okay, so I see questions. Um, let me see. The first one. Um, can you give examples of some work that's been identified for staff approval that really should not have been assigned to staff? Um, well, it depends on how your commission works. Um, some commissions really, in Kalamazoo, 80% of our reviews were staff reviews because they were pretty much, you know, slam dunks. Yeah, you need a new roof, you need a new roof, fine. Be sure you use some color other than white for the drip edge and some things like that that were pretty simple too. So when there's lead paint, if it can be replaced or repaired with something that is a close match, let's say for example, a porch deck where there has been lead paint on the floor and it's in pretty rough shape. Again, it depends on what the applicant is asking to do. If they're asking, um, and saying we want to rip up all the porch deck or we want to put uh, uh, plywood over it and then put indoor outdoor carpet over the whole surface and that means the lead paint's no longer available to bother anybody that should not be a staff approval but if they say we want to strip all the paint and replace a few of the boards that need to be replaced with wood that matches that could be a staff approval because that really kind of boils down to more of a repair than a replacement I think that whenever the word replacement comes into, total replacement comes into the application, that pretty much needs to go to um, to the full commission to make a decision because it's going to be a permanent change that needs to happen. I'm trying to think if there's any more. Sometimes doors are asked to be replaced and um, not, you know, Back door, maybe a little bit more than a front door. It might be okay if it's got lead paint on it, but um, it's it's kind of a case by case basis. I've done trainings for a long time with historic district commissions, and none of your decisions are precedent setting. There, one may be practice for the other, but it doesn't automatic that the next decision that's similar is going to have a similar outcome. You need to make the best decision for the house as a whole or the building as a whole, and that may be administrative. It may be um, it it may be 
full commission if in your city your administrative approvals are done by a building official who's not a trained preservationist uh, you might want to hold more of those decisions for the full commission not necessarily the um the administrative review so it depends on logistically within your community how who handles the staff decisions who handles the administrative decisions did that help at all yeah okay the second question how much pushback do you get from the public because they are anxious about lead um it depends i mean i i would get people all the time that would just say oh my the house is filled with lead we need to do this 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 and this and this and i would you know be able to educate them and tell them about what they you know to handle the problem they don't necessarily need to replace everything um we don't get an awful lot of pushback we sometimes will get a pushback from an agency that is a nonprofit housing agency that's handling the remediation and they might say look we've only got blankety blank dollars to do this um we can't afford to do it what we consider and you consider the right way which is uh taking the paint off and rehabbing the window and putting the sash tracks in we, we can't afford to do it that way we've only got this much money to spend and this child has an elevated blood lead level so then you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because this agency is trying to make its money go as far as it can, but at the same time, they're going to have to make a permanent change to the historic resource. So this is a decision you have to make. Um, the sample that I had up here of the uh, the grandparents that were taking care of their grandchildren was a two or three rounds of going back and forth with the agency saying, OK, this is what we would like to see. This is what you would like to see. And we came to the decision that we could just fix those upper sashes in place so they were no longer a hazard. And then the lower sashes could be replaced to match and to fit in the frame. And so and that that worked out very well. So there may be a little bit of uh, negotiation that has to go on. Now, if it's a landlord who just wants to get this this nightmare off his back and he wants to just get it done, 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 um, you can maybe hold on a little bit harder and say, no, you, you, it has to be done the right way. You know, we don't want to permanently alter this historic resource so that it no longer no longer tells the story it's supposed to in our city. But uh, you get you get some pushback. Um, people, I have found that in general most people that are concerned about lead paint don't really know the facts they just hear lead and they panic like the um the gal that contacted me because um all the doorknobs she got some of the pink test swabs and all her doorknobs were testing positive and and you know there's a difference between a a, a doorknob that can be a hazard and a doorknob where it's not hazardous not bioavailable it's not something that you can ingest or inhale it's just a piece of metal that you grab that happens to have a little bit of lead in the in the alloy. So once you give people a little bit of education about it, there's a lot of um, that could calm people down a lot. Because and keep in mind too that the folks that engage in lead abatement, um, they want to find lead everywhere because they get paid by the number of windows they replace, not the number of windows that need to be replaced. So sometimes uh, you need to talk to the agency and make sure that they're not um, just taking a quick and easy path. We're just gonna throw it all out. We're gonna put new stuff in. And then 15 years from now, when those, when those vinyl windows start shedding cadmium into the house, then we'll just do it all over again with some new windows. So um, yeah, it's that you can get pushback from people. I find that, if you can educate yourself on lead hazards, um, that can a lot so that you can kind of have an idea of what really is a hazard and what's not. MHPN has an excellent booklet on lead hazards and how to deal with them, where the hazard really is. And so that I would recommend that, that your commission learn a little bit more about them if they need to have a... Um, you know, if they need to make a decision on a lead project. Uh, and before you actually need to make the decision, there's a couple of really good booklets out from EPA that talk about is the one that I really like is the one that's aimed at the homeowner. And it talks about how to work on your own old house while keeping your family safe. And it's simple things like 
okay, you're working in the bathroom, so you drape off the bathroom and nobody uses it while you're working on it. And you wet mop outside every single day and you make sure you keep it clean and keep the kids out of there. And the cat, because if the cat goes in there and lays in your pile of lead chips and then the baby cut, cuddles it, you could be in trouble. So, you know, there's just ways to learn how to how to work lead safe. And it's it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. So, yeah, you get you get pushback sometimes from people, but uh, people tend my 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 feeling is that people tend to respond very well to straightforward information about what really is a hazard and what's not. You know, um, I had a, an associate that was going nuts because she had her grandmother's old mixing bowls, the old uh, Pyrex mixing bowls. She's I can't use these anymore because there's lead in the glaze. The glaze was applied at 2500 degrees. It's on the outside of the bowl, food goes on the inside. If you want to be sure you're safe, rinse it out, dry it before you use it. The food's not going to be on the outside. Then you're good. So um, sometimes they just, if people get an idea of, of what they can do and what they can't do and when to really, when to panic and when not to panic. I have another version of this that I do for parents that's called when to panic. So yeah, another one? Yes. Um, so windows are primary source of friction, but what others that you would need to be alert to? Um, there are doors, you know, doors as they open and close, especially what, you know, the, the wonder of an old house where the door doesn't quite always close. It rubs a little bit on the frame. And so you get a little bit of friction there. Um, sometimes the door will rub on a floor. Um, if you have a house that has painted floors, that were painted with a lead paint, then obviously your floor could also be a source of a friction surface. So anything where the interaction between the components of the house or furniture could create dust, that is the place where if there's lead paint on the on the surface, you could end up with a hazard from, um, from the lead dust. Now, the remediation for that is really not that hard. You get yourself a Swiffer wet jet and just run it all over all the bare wood in the house every so often, and that's going to pick up most of the lead. You know, if there is any lead dust, that's going to pick it up. So, um, and teach your kids to wash their hands before they eat every single time. You know, once they're old enough to teach them to do that, teach them to wash their hands before they eat, and then they're not going to get it inside. So, yeah. Okay. Uh... Okay, you just um, mentioned um, the lead paint um, booklet. Um, it's on our mm -hmm. website. I just said, share the link in the chat box. Excellent. And, um, this is a participant saying that um, they've read a number of written materials on lead issue, but sometimes they are conflicting in what they say. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing you want to look at is dates. On the document, whatever you're reading, whether it's a report you find online or a book or something like that, um, old stuff may not have much of a panic level at all. Stuff getting into the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, has that kind of panic feeling to it that there's no, and, and something you'll even find today is there's no safe level of lead. And that is true, but the current level of concern that I said was 3.5 is actually the average background level of lead that almost everybody has in their blood. Okay, so we're looking at something that's elevated above that level, then we need to start, or at least the HUD and EPA and, and the um, health departments want to be concerned about blood lead levels that above that because it can it can be a real challenge. Um it and the the key thing too for a family to remember and for you know landlords to remember is once the source of lead can be identified, then you can get rid of it. Um Lead can be in weird places that might affect a child, but wouldn't actually, the house is not the component that is dangerous. Uh, many of us, I'm sure you all remember giving your baby daddy's keys to play with. Well, the, um, the lubricant that's in a lot of car locks and in some home locks is often a lead graphite. So baby puts the keys in their mouth and starts sucking on them the actual metal keys that are used on a daily basis and suddenly they've got they've got some lead in their system it's probably not going to be enough to make them seriously ill but that it could be cumulative all it takes to poison a child is if you if you can imagine the amount of um an artificial sweetener that's in a packet okay and divide that by about 
120. So take that powder and say a 120 is that that's enough to give a child a permanent disability if they ingest it or inhale it. Okay, so it doesn't take much, which is why you want to be as careful as you can be. But getting rid of the lead by stripping an entire house or covering it with vinyl siding is just it's it's a it's a it's almost an overkill in my personal opinion to solving the problem to making sure that the kids are safe. Um, you know, it's it, it may be present, there may be lead paint there on the trim that runs around the ceiling of the living room, but is that a hazard to your child? It's not a friction surface. Is there lead paint on the window frame? Yeah, that may be because it's gonna produce a little bit of dust going up and down. Um, but once you've stripped it and you've recoated it with new paint, there may be a few tiny bits of lead that were kind of soaked into the wood really well, but it's no longer a hazard because it's covered with a new surface. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, have you found that lead remediation has been covered when the federal and state tax credits are being used? It depends on how it's done. Remember, with the federal and state tax credit, the question is always materials and techniques. What materials are you going to use to remediate the lead paint? What are the techniques that are going to be used? And yes, that probably would be a covered project if it was done in a way that preserved the character defining features, et cetera, et cetera, that follows all the standards. So yeah, it would not be covered if like we're going to do wholesale window replacement, um, uh, we're going to strip out all the trim, we're going to throw all the doors away, and we're going to put vinyl siding up. No, that's not going to be covered. It has to meet the historic standards. But if it does, I would say that it, I would be very surprised if it um, uh, was not considered eligible for a tax credit project because it seems like a natural. Um, next question. Who would be responsible for the cost of follow-up monitoring? The property owner, the agency putting in the interim control? That would be, depends on what the agreement says. So since that can, it when when you get a federal grant that helps to cover lead hazard remediation, um, there's an agreement that's signed between the federal agency and the city. Quite often, that grant is given to a local nonprofit housing agency that will actually uh, make the grant happen, make the work happen, facilitate the work. And so then, so there's another agreement there as a subgrantee between the city and this agency that's actually doing the work. And then you've got that final agreement of what it says between the um, what level of remediation is chosen, whether it's going to be interim controls or whether it's going to be abatement, that should be covered uh, in, in that agreement. So I can't say what it would be. Most of the time, I'm not, being on, a, on the Historic District Commission and running that, I'm not familiar with that end of who does the, uh, the inspections, the monitoring at a later date. The same way that I'm not familiar with how much it costs to paint a house. I just know whether you can replace that much when you're painting a house. So it's a, if it's a, I'm not sure of that end of the process, but I would say that the answer to that question is probably going to be in the agreement that the property owner has signed with the agency or the city that's providing the work or having it done. Or if the owner is having it done themselves, which does happen occasionally, um, then again, that would be, that should be part of, um, that should be part of whatever agreement they have with the abatement contractor. So. I can't answer that for sure. It might be the agency. It might be the homeowner. Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, next question. Does a homeowner have to be certified to work on their own home? No. No. It's a, If you can take the class, it's a really good idea just because it helps you to look at all the different places where there might be a concern, where you need to be careful in how you work. Like when you're when you're scraping or sanding paint, you want to work wet. You want to have a bottle of water there so you can spray it on there, wipe all the dust off with paper towels, and then throw the paper towels in the trash. So then you understand what the process is. But no, you do not need to be to work on your own home. You do not need to be um, have the RRP training. Uh, 
the key thing is, is the person doing the work being paid to do the work? That person should be RRP certified. OK, same way for moving uh, asbestos wrapping in an old furnace or something like that. You can do it yourself on your own home that you own. Or if but if it, someone who's being paid to do it does it, they have to follow all these rules. So. Hey, next question. Uh, are companies that do lead remediation licensed or certified in some way? They are. There's a uh, there's a, the RRP training is like. Step one. And there's like four or five or six levels above that, depending on what type of work is being done, where you're going to be doing dealing with lead paint. And so they should have had the training. It should be somewhere on their website or on their documentation that you look at that says that they are certified um, for this levels of, of hazardous material work, lead work, asbestos work. Sometimes they combine several, especially if it's a, a, a company that specializes in remediation of, of hazards like that they should have all those certifications. So yes, they should be. Um, if you have uh, a bunch of people coming to paint your house, you've got a company you've hired, he's gonna come, he's gonna paint your whole house and he's got three people that work under him. Only the supervisor needs to be lead certified. The um, All the other people working under him do not need to be. Or they need to know that they can't do power washing. They need to know that uh, they have to control the chips and the paint and the dust. It has to be done in a certain way, but it's up to that supervisor to actually um, do that. They need the certification. You need somebody on site that's certified, but it doesn't necessarily have to be everybody that's working on the house. Okay, next question. Uh, what do you recommend for home testing for lead for surfaces? Um, the, the, the 3M sticks are great. Um, you can buy them at any, you know, the, you know, the big box stores. Um, they do a good job. One thing that I will tell you is because these things look like um, they look, they're about the size of a cigarette. And inside is a little glass vial that when you're ready to start testing, you bend the cigarette shaped thing and it breaks the glass vial and the chemical starts spreading through all the fibers in that um, testing stick. Now, you can either use one stick to test one area, and if you do, it'll be, if it has lead in it, I'm getting, I'm going back to one of the pictures I had. See that lower right picture of the, it's a bathtub. That's, it'll make a pink stripe like that if there's lead in the surface that you're testing, okay? Now, you can, these are not cheap, they're like, $18 for six, okay? So one of the tips that I have done very successfully is instead of using the stick directly on what I'm testing, I squeeze the, the cigarette tube thingy just a little bit and I use a Q-tip, get some of the fluid onto the Q-tip and then test. But use a fresh Q-tip each time because once you've rubbed it on a surface, if you get that response, you don't wanna use the same thing again. But I would use the 3M, uh, they, they do a good job. Um, if you want to have more extensive testing, you can have, you know, a professional organization come in and test it for you. But I would use the 3M sticks. Um, and keep in mind that you won't, if you're testing red paint, you may not get a true correct response because some of the pigment from the paint may give you that pink look that you don't know about. And if you can get, if you're testing paint and you want to find out well, you know, the top surface is latex paint because, you know, the previous owner painted it eight years ago. Peel back a little bit and test the lower levels because there may be lead paint on a, on a previous level. So, yeah. But, yeah, use the Q-tips. It'll save you. You'll be able to use a lot more sticks with a, and a lot less money and test a lot more surfaces. But a, a fresh Q-tip each time you change surfaces. So, um, are there any products besides paint that still have lead in them? Um, well, there's all the things in my pictures there. Um, it it really depends on what it is. Lead is a very useful um, uh, element. It does all sorts of good things. Like we said, it's a natural microbicide. So it can be very useful in some applications. You just don't want it to, you don't want to use it or have it someplace where kids can get um, or even adults can get it inside their bodies, okay? So some of the 
painted children's toys that have lead paint on them, they can be a hazard. Um, uh, little chips of paint, you know, kids picking away at the floor and, and eating a chip of paint, it's like, that's like, no, don't, you don't want that. You don't want that. So um, other products um, that the, I'm thinking products that a historic district commission would need to be concerned about that would be on a house. There's things like doorknobs. Some old metals also have a little bit of lead in the alloy. So maybe uh, uh, gutters on houses and um, uh, you know the straps that hold the gutters in place, maybe, but um, it really just depends on what the material is. And the, the little pink test, strips, test sticks will show it, um, it definitely will show it on a painted surface and on a lot of hard surfaces, it'll come out that way. Now, if you really want to go whole hog, there's a device called an X-ray fluorescence, an XRF gun that tests the, the gun itself costs anywhere between 10 and $20,000. This is what the people who are doing the lead assessment will be using to test all the paint surfaces in the house or in the building. Um, and that's how they write their report based on that reading. So they can tell where there is lead. And all these items that I've shown in this picture, these are all things that did have lead in according to an XRF reading. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, next question. Is Kalamazoo known for lead issues that turn up in this population? Um, this is the this is the really big problem is that there are some places that show as having very little problem with lead. Um, and there are some places that show as having a big problem with lead. Kalamazoo is not extraordinary. Kalamazoo is right on the median in the middle. But the difference quite often is the fact that in this county, wherever it is, they didn't have a, a rigorous testing program. So they don't know whether there's lead there because they're not testing the kids. They're not evaluating the houses for, um, you know, for there being a lead hazard. So no, Kalamazoo is not, Kalamazoo is very typical for the age of the houses that we have. And because most of our housing was built before, actually probably before 1970, 95% of our housing was probably built before 1970. And uh, so that means about 75% was built back when lead was expected to be, you know, would be a, would be some of the paint that went on the house. So no, Kalamazoo is not extraordinary. Almost every city, county has some kind of uh, rating for lead, unless you're in a, a suburb that's just brand new and it's all been built since 2000, the chances of finding lead are um, are about the same everywhere. Okay, I think this is the last question. Um, Sharon, are you going to do a session on lead paint issue at the 2024 MHPN State Conference when it's in Kalamazoo? If I am asked, I would be happy to. I would love to do that. Yes. Yes, because I just I don't want people to panic over it. It it is a real hazard. It does need to be considered, but it's not really difficult to deal with. You know, so I would be happy to do a session live and then I could bring things in. I could maybe even get someone to come with in with an XRF and show you how they actually test the the paint. That would be that could be really fun. Yeah. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions. Um, and um, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out afterwards. Again, this webinar will be recorded. So um, what you will receive an email when the recording is available. And um, feel free to just go back to uh, watch it or share it with your the people that you think will benefit from it. And um, our next webinar is scheduled for October 26th. And next um, month is Archaeology Month. So we are going to have a session. Um, the topic is going to be a deep dive into TCPs and National Register listed archaeological sites in Michigan. And we hope to see you then. And thank you again, Sharon, so much for your time and effort to present and um, and thank you and hope to see you all next time.